Let's pick up where we left off with the last video in exploring how a basic force field constructs analytically a potential energy surface, and that's what molecular mechanics really is. And so I've, I've already illustrated for you uh, the process of fitting a one-dimensional curve, a bond stretching coordinate, and in particular noted that a, a simple way to express a function like this, uh, this sort of curve, is to expand a polynomial function about the equilibrium distance and to take advantage of the properties of a Taylor expansion. So here's a generic polynomial expansion. It's got a term that's linear in displacement from equilibrium, quadratic, cubic. Uh, that's well known in applied math from the Taylor expansion and that the coefficients of those individual terms are equal to the derivatives of the energy with respect to the coordinate times the displacement, where the first derivative multiplies the linear term, the second derivative the quadratic term, the third derivative the cubic term, and so on. Uh, and of course there's these little factorials that come out in front as well. So one of the uh, one of the motivations I'll emphasize again, just to keep in mind, why do we expand about the equilibrium distance? It's because typically, thanks to spectroscopy, we really know the most about the curve in this region. Remember that, for instance, if I do infrared spectroscopy, I get the energy separation between the first, sorry, the zeroth and the first vibrational level, and those levels are dominated by distances near REQ. If I really want to know what's going on at very far distances, I need to be accessing very high energy levels, and I tend to have less and less information about, about those regions. And, of course, they're, they're also less and less chemically important often. Okay, and once again, the, the first derivative coefficient is actually made simple by using the equilibrium position as the reference position because that's a critical point, and so the first derivative goes to zero. And then the second derivative term is actually the force constant if I truncate at that point for... Hooke's law for a spring, which says that an energy is equal to a reference energy plus one-half k, the force constant, times the displacement squared. Okay, and so I, now I, I want to really illustrate this for a particular case. Let's consider the bond stretch between two carbon atoms, but now I want to emphasize the difference between atom types. And so if I take as my functional form the, uh, the truncated quadratic expression, and so notice that if REQ, if, if R, that is, if I'm exploring the energy for R equal to REQ, well, I'll plug in my uh, value of REQ, which I've defined to be zero, so U at REQ is zero, and also I'll have REQ minus REQ squared, so that's zero squared is zero, so the entire thing will be equal to zero, and that's uh, what I would like. I would like that when I am at my equilibrium distance, I am strain-free, and so that will define the zero of energy. Having no strain is zero, and any other displacement, either forward or backward from the equilibrium position, because I'm going to square it, doesn't matter whether it's negative or positive, that will give me a positive value for this term, and I will, as long as my force constant is also positive, that will mean that the energy goes up. It becomes positive relative to zero. All right, and so uh, now that I'll, I'll throw away the uh, terms that are actually zero, the simple expression is simply U is equal to one-half K, some kind of force constant, R minus REQ squared. So if I now imagine energy, U, as a function of a distance between two carbon atoms, let me start by thinking about two alkene carbon atoms. And so here's ethylene. It'll be the parent system that I might use to define a strain-free set of carbon double bond bonded to another carbon double bond. And uh, as everyone should have memorized, there are a few things. If you're an organic chemist, you should memorize. The distance of two carbon atoms in a strain-free double bond is 1. That distance is 1.34 angstroms. And so I'll then get one of these uh, potential energy curves, the standard bond stretching potential energy curve, the REQ, and so remember that my, my force field consists of chiseling into some stone tablets all the things that I need to do a calculation. And so one of the things that I will need is what is REQ, but I, I've got a new index here. It's not just subscript EQ. It's REQ comma 
C alkene to C alkene. That is a single constant that I will need in my force field. And then in addition, in order to capture the proper tightness of this potential energy curve, that is the steepness with which it rises, that's going to be dictated by the force constant. As you can see, if I choose a very, very large force constant, I'll be taking this quadratic displacement and multiplying it times something big, and so the energy will go up rapidly. On the other hand, if I use a very, very small force constant, I will get a shallower parabola. This equation defines a parabola. And for a particular functionality, I just need to you know, pick, by perhaps fitting to infrared spectra, for example, uh, what will I use for this force constant, which again, note it is indexed. I'll carry with it a subscript. This is the specific force constant for one alkene carbon bonded to another alkene carbon. So really, the equation that I'm going to solve in order to generate this curve is the energy associated with one C alkene being bonded to another C alkene. And if in the video it's hard to see these really tiny subscripts, I'm, I'm sorry for that, uh, but it does say C alkene, C alkene, is equal to one half times the force constant for a C alkene, C alkene, times the actual distance I'm holding the bond at. So I'm going to be evaluating this energy for some geometry. So I compute the distance based on the Cartesian coordinates, perhaps, of the atoms. And then I subtract the equilibrium distance, which is chiseled into my stone. I square the difference. I multiply times the force constant. I get the energy. That is a parabola, right? It's not this curve. It's not this black curve. It's an approximation to the black curve. So here is a real parabola. Uh, the blue curve is the parabola. And it would describe the energy as I displace. And so one of the things you'll notice is as I start pushing the bond uh, to shorter and shorter bond distances, the real curve rises more rapidly than the parabola. So I would have an error at maybe this distance. Who knows what it is? Maybe it's 1.2. I would predict the strain to be less than it actually should be. But that, you know, that's the nature of my force field. It's a simple function. And then uh, conversely, as I stretch the bond, you'll notice, let's say I go to 1.5 angstroms, which is perhaps right here. I'll be predicting a considerably higher energy. I'm on the blue curve compared to the black curve, and I just have to decide if I want to accept that error or not. I can adjust the force constant to do better on this side, for instance, but then I'll do less well on this side. And of course, the error derives from the, just the nature of the functional form. So of course, a real bond breaks. At some point, these two carbon atoms stop interacting with one another, and that is a fixed energy which will never change. But this energy expression here, this is quadratic, and it becomes infinite as RCC becomes infinite. So this curve just goes up to infinity. So that is a feature of a quadratic force field, if you will. It is not possible to break a bond. Instead, uh, the further and further apart the atoms get, the higher and higher the energy goes. And so that is uh, unrealistic. On the other hand, it sort of defines what you use a force field for. You would not want to use a force field to describe reactive chemistry, where you're trying to make and break bonds. Or if you did want to use a force field for that, you would clearly have to adopt a different functional form. And so part of a force field really is choosing the functional forms that you plan to employ and, and chisel into those uh, apocryphal stone tablets. And so now let's uh, consider the next case. Now it's not two alkene carbons bonded to one another. It's two alkane carbons bonded to one another. So I've got a different equilibrium bond distance. Here's another thing all organic chemists should have memorized, that in ethane, the CC bond distance is 1.54 angstroms. And if I were to ask you, uh, should the force constant for ethane be larger or smaller than the force constant for ethene? I'm going to pause for a minute and let you think about that. OK, and I hope most of you thought to yourself, well, duh, of course, the force constant is smaller. It is easier to stretch or compress a single bond than it is to stretch or compress a double bond. That means that the energy well will be less tight. It'll be more shallow, which means a smaller force constant. And it's just a different one, right? So. I will have, uh, so far I've discussed two different KCCs, so I really want to drive home this point. It's the, the indices on the constants, which are force constants and equilibrium distances, are associated with atom types, not just atomic number. 
So uh, that now raises the question, where do all these force constants come from and how many are there? Well, a uh, consideration you should keep in mind is the more atom types you elect to include in your force field, the more sensitive your force field is going to be to chemical reality. So were I to adopt the idea that there was only one carbon type, because there's only one carbon nucleus, I would have a lot of trouble with all the different bonding situations in which carbon can find itself. I would have to accept some pretty big errors for a number of different kinds of bonds. However, I don't have to accept that. I can, in fact, define a number of different carbon types. And in organic chemistry, which, of course, is particularly rich in a bonding variety, if you will, and especially variety of the carbon atom, it's not that unusual to find 20 plus carbon types. And so I've already named a few. You could have sp3, sp2, sp, carbocation, carbanion, and actually uh, you might have a special type for a carbon in a three-membered ring, or a carbon in a four-membered ring, and a carbon in a five-membered ring. You could have a special carbon for methyl groups, and a different carbon for methylene groups. Uh, it's just entirely up to you how many you'd like to have. Obviously, the more you include, the more fine-grained, we might say, your force field is capable of being. So why not include a huge number? Well, keep in mind that every time you define a new atom type, if you would like your force field to be capable of bonding that new type to all of the other atoms, you will have to introduce that many, all of the other atoms, new force constants for your new atom bonding to all the former ones, and new equilibrium lengths for your new atom bonding to all the former ones, and that's going to start to add up. So in particular, the number of bond stretch parameters is going to go up as n squared, where n is the number of atom types. And that's because every atom type being able to bond to every other atom type, well, there's two atom types in a bond. So if there are n atoms and you can have either one at either end of the bond, it's n squared. So, of course, there's some symmetry there. So really it's n times n minus 1 over 2. I'll let you play with that if you're sitting on a bus and want to think about that. But in any case, it rises quadratically with the number of atom types. So where do we get these uh, various parameters from. And I've emphasized up till now that for bond stretching, uh, you certainly can take advantage of infrared spectroscopy if you have sufficient data there. And where infrared stretches come in, in in the IR spectrum is very useful for assigning bond force constants. Another approach, which is used increasingly, and uh, especially nowadays, is to use very high-level quantum mechanical calculations. So a nice thing about a quantum mechanical calculation is you can, in principle, compute the entire potential energy curve from converged quantum mechanics, and now you've got a uh, uh, curve defined at very large distances as well, which you can fit quite closely. And so we'll, we'll certainly be talking much more about quantum mechanics later in the course, but for now, I'll just mention that's another way to get data against which to parameterize your functions. So I've really uh, spent a lot of time on bond stretching. Now let's think a little bit about angle bending. <clears throat> So angle bending, and here's a nice generic molecule, ABC, argon, boron, carbon, in the old notation. Uh, if we define the angle theta to be the valence angle subtended at B by atoms A and C, then if you look at the energy as a function of angle, you will uh, get a curve that looks a bit like a bond stretching curve, at least over a certain distance. And so uh, you can tell I, I did some copy pasting here at some point and never took away the CC single bond distance. Maybe that's 1.54 in some units that are reasonable for this angle. I guess that's neither radians nor degrees, but let's pretend it's not a mistake. Uh, in any case, there's an equilibrium value, and I'll call that theta EQ. And again, I've got to index it to specify what are my atom types for which this equilibrium angle is being defined. So A, B, and C. Maybe these are atoms that really do only have one type. Maybe otherwise they'd actually need a subscript. It could be that atom A is a sp3 carbon, and atom B is an sp2 carbon, and atom C is an sp2 carbon. Who knows? 
But in any case, I can define that equilibrium angle. I can also define a force constant and continue to use a quadratic or harmonic. These terms mean the same thing. Harmonic or quadratic is the simplest sort of force field. It's truncation at the first term in the Taylor expansion that is not zero. And because we take the expansion about the critical point, the first derivative term always is zero. Note that uh, where with bond stretching, the number of parameters increased as n squared, where n was the number of atom types, now we've actually got an index where you could have n atom types at this position, n atom types at this position, and n atom types at this position. So in fact, with every new atom type you introduce into your force field, uh, you will be increasing cubically as the third power of the number of types. And uh, finally, let's think about another common uh, uh, internal coordinate that in conformational analysis is considered. And this is one actually I asked you to think about in uh, a few video lectures ago, which was the torsional coordinate associated with butane. And so I'd like to spend a little bit of time on this. There's a lot of data on this graph. But the dark black solid line curve that's illustrated here that I'm tracing out now with the cursor, let's say that that is the accurate potential energy curve for rotation of butane. And the coordinate here in radians is the torsion angle. And so the torsion angle is defined, if I look at this Fisher projection, I'll define the torsion angle omega to be the dihedral angle between this carbon-carbon bond and the back carbon-carbon bond that's hidden by the Fisher circle here. So when omega is zero degrees, I'll have the conformation of butane that is eclipsed and has this methyl group completely eclipsing this methyl group. So that occurs at zero radians, and it occurs at two pi radians. And that is the maximum on the potential energy curve. On the other hand, uh, if I have omega at 180 degrees or pi radians, that will put this methyl group over here relative to this methyl group over here. That's the anti-periplanar conformation of butane. And that defines the global minimum on the potential energy curve. That would be right here. And then as all of you probably remember from organic chemistry, there are also two gauche minima, which are somewhat higher in energy on this curve. They're about a kcal and a half up. And there are barriers for the rotation from antiperiplanar to gauche, and they occur roughly three kcals on this dark black curve. All right, so what functional form might I use to represent that curve? Well, first off, this is unique compared to bond stretching and angle bending. It's unique in that it is uh, periodic. So after I've gone through 2 pi radians of torsion angle, I'm back to where I started. So I arguably want to express this function in terms of periodic functions. And one way to do that would be with a, a Fourier series. So the equation that's shown up here is essentially a Fourier fit. It says that the energy associated with a given value of the torsion angle, and the torsion angle will be defined for atoms A, B, C, and D. It takes four atoms to define a dihedral angle, which is equivalent to a torsion angle. Uh, for historical purposes, I'll put a factor of one half out front, and I'll have a sum and I'm going to sum over a certain number of sine waves. So j here is just some index. Maybe I'll use, and I said sine, but I guess this one uses cosine. It's up to you what you want to, what you want to use. Uh, and the index itself that I choose to use may well depend on the atom types a, b, c, and d. So it seems pretty obvious for butane. I will want to sum over three terms. I'll want at least a threefold symmetric term because I seem to have one, two, three minima. So I'll have a one-fold symmetry term, a two, I should say periodic, one-fold periodic, two-fold periodic, three-fold periodic. So J would be three. I'm not limited to that. I can add more periodicity if I want to. And there may be certain kinds of, uh, of torsions in other molecules 
where I would indeed perhaps want a fourfold periodic term. Imagine something rotating that's connected to a metal in a, uh, an octahedral complex. Then you would see four other things close by as you were rotating, and so you might indeed want a uh, fourfold periodic term. But that's just a parameter, right? It's something you're going to chisel into your force field. A series of coefficients, so these will describe the amplitude of the waves that you're using. And then if you think about the function that's shown here, basically we're using cosines, and by having this uh, negative one to a certain power term, we are adjusting where their minima and maxima are, and the phase angle adjusts the minima and maxima as well, whether they're up or down and where. So I'm just going to let you play with various values if you'd like to see that, but I'll ask you to trust me. This is a correct way to, to represent the curves that are shown down here. And that is what these lighter lines are. So the diamonds that I'm tracing now, this diamond curve, you'll notice that it starts at a maximum value. It goes down to a minimum value, and then it goes up again periodically to its maximum value. So it is one-fold periodic. So it would be the term associated with j equals 0. And we'll index this as 0, 1, and 2. Uh, if you look at the boxes, you see that this term... Oh, let's not do the boxes. Sorry, let's do the circles. If you look at the circles, it's almost flat, so it might be a little hard to see, but here is a maximum, here's a minimum, just barely below the maximum, here's another maximum, here's a minimum, here's a maximum. So it, the twofold term plays very little role in this particular rotation. And then finally, there's the threefold term, that's the boxes, and it, go, it starts up, down, up, down, up, down. Notice that the nature of these waves is is are the nature is that of course all the maxima and minima are the same they're they're cosine waves the reason we can fit a curve that has different levels of maxima and minima is that we are summing together different waves so even though the threefold term gives the same value of energy for the two minimum conformations gauche and antiperiplanar the onefold term raises the energy of this one relative to this one and as a result, I push this curve up. So the triangles that are shown here are the sum of these three curves, the diamonds, the circles, and the boxes. And you'll see that the triangles actually do fit quite well the black curve. And so this, is a, this was really done with an Excel spreadsheet, so it is a true Fourier fit to a particular potential energy curve generated point by point from, say, a quantum mechanical calculation. Okay, well that was a rather long explanation. I do want to uh, spend a, a tiny bit of time on just a little piece of chemistry and say that actually sometimes interpreting these curves can be interesting. So if I think about what's the meaning of these various curves, the one-fold, the two-fold, and the three-fold, is there a physical meaning to them as opposed to just a very simple, uh, uh, you know, functional forms used to fit an arbitrary curve, you can in fact assign some physical meaning to it, and sometimes it's interesting to interpret that. So a one-fold term, if you ask why would the energy be high at one end and low at another end, that can be associated with dipole-dipole interactions. So if this bond has some dipole associated with it, and the back bond also has a dipole associated with it, there clearly will be a single point on the full torsion where the two dipoles are exactly aligned, and that's bad, so that'll be the highest energy. And at the exact opposite point, the dipoles will be opposed to one another, and that will be the lowest energy point. So if you will, the one-fold periodic term can represent a dipole-dipole electrostatic interaction. The three-fold term in this case is a pretty obvious one. It is the steric interaction that occurs when bonds eclipse one another. And organic chemists say steric. Of course, it turns out that in, in the uh, physical laws, the, the word steric never actually appears. Instead, you know that uh, there's gravity, there's strong and weak nuclear forces, and there's electromagnetism. So really, it's electrical interactions. It's the electrons in a bond being repelled by electrons in another bond as they overlap one another. And that electrostatic repulsion is what we call sterics. But OK, that's a small physics aside. In any case, that's what's in the threefold term. 
The twofold term in butane matters very little at all, but if you think about what it uh, might be associated with, it's actually associated with hyperconjugation. And uh, we may spend a little more time on that later on, just because it's an interesting effect, but since it's not really illustrated here, I think we'll stop. Okay. Uh, I'm going to go back one slide because some of you may have been thinking a bit in noticing that the periodicity of a torsion looks nothing like a bond stretching coordinate. And that's why we went to a Fourier series instead of using a polynomial expansion. On the other hand, I told you that the angle bending could be represented with a harmonic expansion. But if you think about it, there's a certain periodicity to angle bending too because what happens when I get to theta equals 180 degrees or pi radians? Well, at that stage I'm linear and clearly what ought to happen over here if I go beyond linear it would be sort of like inverting the angle. Well, that's symmetrically related and it should go down again. There'd be another minimum over here that would be the reflection of this. So if you really did want your force field to be able to capture that turning over and going back down through a linear bond angle, well, you couldn't use this functional form. It won't work. If I were to plot the parabola in here, it obviously just goes up, up, up to some very large value. And at 180 degrees, it will be whatever value you've recorded. And if you somehow try to define an, define an angle bigger than 180 degrees, it's going to keep going up. So you would have to adopt a different functional form, and indeed, you'd have to decide how you'd like to represent it to have that character. However, since force fields typically are designed to model molecules near their equilibrium structures, because we're working with them at relatively low temperatures and we're not imagining them shaking out to linear bond angles, one doesn't necessarily care that one does very badly in super high energy regions because you don't expect to access those super high energy regions. And that's just a choice. So remember, picking the functional forms, that is a choice and it dictates what your force field will be good for. Okay, so we'll finish up with torsions here uh, with noting that all of these constants that have to get chiseled into the stone tablet, the number of Fourier terms, the amplitudes of the individual terms, the uh, the phase angles associated with the terms, those will now increase as n to the fourth power, where n is the number of atom types. And so you can see that that can get really big really fast. So what are the steps involved in computing a strain energy? Okay, so if I really want my molecular mechanics program to give me back the energy of a molecule, what do I have to do? First, I have to assign an atom type to all of the atoms. So I, as a chemist, will draw into a molecular mechanics program, and we'll actually sit in the lab and do some drawing in the not-too-distant future. And in the process of drawing, I have to tell the program that's going to do the computation what is the atom type for this atom. So that's up to a chemist. I also have to tell the program who's bonded to what, uh, either through the nature of the drawing or I provide an explicit matrix of who's bonded to what, because that's going to define between which atoms do I have to compute uh, stretching uh, strain and for which linkages do I have to compute angle strain and so on. Of course, you could have an algorithm. You could ask your molecular mechanics program to just look at how close you drew things, and if they're within van der Waals contact, it should just know you meant them to be bonded. That could be a little risky, actually, because you might not be such a good drawer, but that's one possibility. And at that stage, now the program, knowing what the atom types are and knowing where the bonds and angles and torsions are, would go and look up on the stone tablets every force constant, every equilibrium value, every phase angle, etc., etc., everything it needs to plug into all the equations that will be used to compute energy. And a good program also should make some sort of rational choice about what to do if some are missing. So you may have drawn a particular molecule and it's got a bond between a, oh, I don't know, let's say it has a bond between a sulfur and a nitrogen. You're interested in a sulfilamine. And it just turns out that the person who invented that force field or the group that invented it they never considered sulfur bonded to nitrogen. Now, so the program could do various things. It could cough and die, deliver an error message and say, sorry, that parameter doesn't exist. Hopefully it tells you which parameter so that you can at least worry about the right thing. And I'm not going to do anything because I think I'd be outputting garbage. 
So that's actually a pretty rational choice. Outputting garbage is a bad thing. On the other hand, uh, the program could assume that you are savvy enough to recognize you're going a little off the reservation, and it might have some generic force constant and equilibrium distance that it applies whenever a first row atom is bonded to a second row atom. Now, ideally, it tells you that at some point, and it, it tells you rather forcefully, oh, by the way, I don't have a specific parameter for this bond, but I've chosen to use these parameters. Do with this as you please. And so that's a possibility. And then finally, it might actually uh, do what I just said and not tell you, and that's sort of unfortunate typically, because you certainly can be led drastically astray, but in any case, uh, that's part of the, uh, the calculational process. Now, happily enough, all of those equations, which are just a bunch of floating point operations, square things, uh, multiply things, add and subtract things, a uh, good computer will do that in the tiniest fraction of a second for the geometry that you provided. And there's a few things I want you to think about uh, as you think about that calculation. One is, the minimum, if, if you were able to draw your molecule so that every single linkage, bond linkage, angle linkage, torsion linkage, was at exactly the equilibrium value that's defined for that linkage in the force field, your molecule would have an energy of zero because it has no strain. Everything is at its perfect distance or angle or torsion. And so that zero is worth thinking about. It's, it's a hypothetical molecule. It's very rare that such molecules exist. A hypothetical molecule in which all of the atoms, and really they're atom types, but all of the atom types, are in strain-free environments. So let's say that you want to compare relative energies of two isomers. So you have two molecules that have the same molecular formula. Note that unless they have the same atom types, you can't actually compare them because they'll be relative, the energy you'll be computing will be relative to different zeros. Right? Zero defines all the atom types in the molecule being strain-free. And if the atom types are different, that may just be a different definition. I'll, I'll show you this graphically in a moment, and that should become more clear. But the, the caveat I want you to take home is you can't compare two different isomers having the same molecular formula unless you know that all the atom types are the same in those two isomers. Should they have different atom types, then what you're going to have to do is somehow place those atom types on a common scale. And one way to do that is to assign enthalpies of formation to the atom types. And so in, in physical organic chemistry, there's something called uh, Benson group equivalence. And I'll, I'll probably say a little more about that in the context of this, this example that's coming up here. So let me show you this uh, comparison, if you will, of atomic typomers, I'll call them. That is not a sanctioned term by IUPAC, but I hope it gets the point across. So if I would like to compare cycloheptane to 1, 2, 3 heptene, and in particular E3 heptene, these are both C7H14 molecules, but cycloheptane is formed of atom types for a force field I'm using. It might not recognize that a seven-membered ring is anything special. It might call these carbon atoms just simple sp3 carbon atoms. And so it would compute for the seven-membered ring some certain amount of strain. And that strain would be associated with probably there's some torsional strain in a seven-membered ring. There might be a little angle bending strain. There's probably not a lot of bond stretching strain. There's no real uh, bad steric clashes here. But in any case, there will be some strain, and it will raise the energy, and so this is what my force field would compute. All right, relative to the unstrained atom types, maybe this value is plus, plus 30. I don't know, we'll say 30 kcals worth of strain. Meanwhile, over here in heptene, forget about where this is relative to this for the moment. This is just the unstrained atom types. I ask how much strain is in this molecule, and maybe there's a little bit of angle bending strain. You know, it's mostly sort of linear, and you, you get a little bit of a lilic strain associated with a double bond. This hydrogen interacts with these uh, hydrogens over here, perhaps. And so there's a small amount of strain. It looks like if this is 30, 
This one might be 15. So the strain energy that would be output would be 30 kcals in this calculation, 15 kcals in this calculation. But does that mean that heptene is a more stable molecule than cycloheptane? No, you have no idea. All you know is that relative to some hypothetical molecule formed from the strain-free atom types, there is less extra strain associated with putting them together the way they are in heptene compared to the way they are in cycloheptane. But in order to compare them equivalently, you would have to know what is the heat of formation. So that's the standard go in the lab and measure something quantity that tells you how stable a molecule is. So I, would, I could go look up the heat of formation of cycloheptane, I could go look up the heat of formation of heptene, and that allows me to compare the two isomers. So really, in order to compare my final calculated values, what I need to do is somehow place this collection of unstrained atom types on a heat of formation scale. So I could ask, you know, what's the heat of formation of seven strain-free methylene groups? And how might I go about getting that? Well, that's this Benson approach that I mentioned a little bit earlier. And the way you would go about getting it is, you would measure the heat of formation of thousands and thousands of organic molecules, for example. And then you would assume that the heats of formation can be decomposed into a sum of heats of formation of all the fragments. And then you would just do a big multilinear regression of known heats of formation, and you know which fragments are in your molecules, and you just figure out what's the best fit for the heat of formation of each individual fragment that will then add up to the correct heats of formation of all the molecules. So you would find, for instance, that maybe a methylene has a heat of formation of minus 15 kcals per mole, just to pick a number. And there are two atom types in heptene that are sp2 carbons, not uh, sp3 carbons. And as a result, the sp2 carbon might have a heat of formation of 0 kcals per mole instead of minus 15. So my collection of unstrained atom types on a common heat of formation scale is higher for the heptene than it is for the cycloheptane. And as I've drawn in this graph, in fact, it would turn out, so even though there's more strain in cycloheptane, that is more strain being added to a more stable starting set of fragments. In 3-heptene, it's less strain added to a less stable set of starting fragments. So that, just by coincidence in this particular drawing, the two heats of formation would end up being very similar. And so if you really you know, can wrap your mind around this graph uh, and keep in mind that what matters is strain relative to unstrained atom types, and you need some sort of a model to define the energy of the unstrained types in order to make comparisons, you will have really captured uh, a key point in molecular mechanics calculations. Well, all right, I'll, I'll let you spend some time wrapping your mind around that thought. And in the next uh, video in the series, we're going to continue and talk about other interactions in molecules not associated with linkages, defined linkages. And I'll talk to you then.